There, there was an affinity right from the start. There was an affinity during the Anglo-Boer War. There was an affinity during the First World War. There was a great affinity through the, during the Second World War. Getting the Navy to have two or three destroyers partly out in the sea nearby. I got the Air Force to put a couple of squadrons of fighters out in the screen around the area. We had two regiments of ACAC guns, ours and South Africans, posted on the sand hills adjacent to the ground, and we couldn't do much more than that. Between South Africans and New Zealanders, rather than South Africans and Australians or anything else, so I think there was a, a natural affinity, and you always play better and more keenly against people you like than people you don't like, funnily enough. And I think we, we've always liked New Zealanders, yeah. The first two international rugby series between the All Blacks and the Springboks in 1921 and 1928 were tied. But the balance began to shift in 1937 when Danny Craven inspired a Springbok team to beat the All Blacks in New Zealand two matches to one. In 1949, New Zealand toured South Africa and lost all four tests. Totally humiliated, they returned home. It had got to a stage by 56 that uh, it was more or less total war. We would, you know, New Zealand were demanding that we win that series and, uh, and otherwise it was the end of rugby for New Zealand. The South Africans arrive confident, having never lost an international test series. This fabled team that played on top of the ground that would run you off your feet, that, would, uh, that had forwards the size of rhinos. And the stories, of course, were, were very big and very strong. And because the All Blacks had lost in 1949, uh, the Springboks just seemed that much bigger than life. And, and, and when they arrived, they sure did look it. I was a nine-year-old boy when the tour started. And I remember myself and my mates, we kept scrapbooks, all of us. We were swept up in this, uh, this tour. But it wasn't just kids, it was adults, it was men and women, all swept up in the, the arrival of the Springboks and the playing off of this, um, this world championship. But the country was really at a point of, they've arrived, now we'll uh, have our share and uh, that sort of ripple went right through the country. Although the New Zealanders welcomed the tourists with open arms, the warm reception had not extended to the rugby field. In every game we played at, whether it was in Masterton or in the countryside or in, in the bush, the place was crazy, you couldn't get into the ground. New Zealand went rugby mad. He has it, he's down also. Trying to come around with that is fundamental. Through the distinctive voice of radio commentator Winston McCarthy, the players quickly became household names. For young Springbok players like Harry Newton Walker, it was the adventure of a lifetime. To record his trip, Harry took his film camera along for the ride. Afrikaans speaking South African, it was an eye opener. <clears throat> it was frightening at, uh, at stages. Ever we went, it was just massive of crowds. If we got onto the train, the train had to stop at certain little stations so people could say hello to us. The New Zealand people are charming and they will give you everything, bar for that 90 minutes or 80 minutes on the field. They, they give you nothing. The first test was played at Dunedin on the South Island. And it was a sort of a, a complete communal attitude, not just a singular attitude of, we must beat the Springboks. Well, as I 
10 or 12 year old I, I sat on the touch line right beside the touch line we talk about an electric atmosphere these days it was unbelievable then their defeat at the hands of the Springboks in 1949 had been a harsh lesson for the New Zealanders. They had since concentrated on building a forward pack that would compete with the mighty South Africans. But after two or three scrums, the All Blacks had to face the harsh reality that little had changed. The Springbok scrum machine was as efficient and ruthless as ever. They were tough. Uh, they were physically and mentally tough in scrums. Front ranker is the foundation of the scrum. That we are uh, in Jaap Becker, he was a, 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 a very solid scrummer. That's why we decided to concentrate on the, the scrum. Our games were born out of the same tradition. Very hard, big, uh, driving forward play dominance, uh, physical dominance over the opposition, no matter which position you were, you had to physically dominate your opposite number. I would say that uh, in the first and second test, yes, Australia, Africa did have us in the scrums because of one or two little wee problems we had in our front row. The New Zealand selectors had opted for Mark Irwin to play alongside the experienced Ian Clark in the first test and Frank McElTamney in the second. Both were young players who didn't possess the experience to cope with a springbok front row. Extremely experienced Beckers and Chris Cox, who what I call sort of put them in a semi-octopus clamp and actually put them in a position which they couldn't get out of, which meant that if I'd held the weight in the, in the scrum in Wellington and, and, and in Christchurch when Tom Morrison sort of said, hey, what the... What's going on out there? You know, we were literally probably either broken the back of uh, Makatamni or Mark Irwin uh, and ruined their rugby forever. Something which, unless you were there and, and experienced what was happening, they were sort of locking them in a position which they couldn't get out of. And if we applied the pressure, it just buckled them up and something would have had to give. And if you can recall, Makatamni at one stage went out of the top of the scrum like a pea between your fingers. Instead of going down and being crunched, he went out the top. But good old Frank. A uh, tremendous player and a tremendous fellow never played for New Zealand again. But despite their battering in the pack, it was the All Blacks who drew first blood with a try by Tiny White and then the defining moment. Ron Jardin intercepted a pass between two Springbok backs and just take off. He slipped in the mud in front of us and it looked as if he might just get caught for a moment. Then he took off and we all kind of took off with him. <laughs> and there were people running down the touchline, falling over each other. And he's off down the sideline for a magnificent and historic individual drive. From that moment on, it was just sheer euphoria. It, it was the greatest day of our life. The All Blacks press the attack. From the scrum, Vincent gets the ball away to Dixon, who kicks infield. Injuries, the Achilles heel of touring teams, were starting to take their toll on the Springboks. I remember one evening at a, uh, at a meeting session of the Springbok side, it looked like a casualty clearing station of an army unit. There were so many players injured and so many players hurt. Another factor was the unconventional training methods of Danny Craven, the South African coach. We had a 10-day training session where Doc Craven took our boots and he loaded them with lead. And we trained with lead-laden boots, um, you know, because in New Zealand it's heavy and wet. And the amount of injuries that came out of that was incredible.